originally from Nelson, grew up there, um, and now work at Massey University and my 20 year anniversary just ticked over a few weeks ago. Um, I've been divided between Palmerston North and Wellington in that time. So my job was in Palmerston North, moved to Wellington, moved back to Palmerston North, but physically I never moved back to Palmerston North. I still live in Wellington, so I drove up from Wellington today, but I generally spend three days a week in Palmerston North um, because of the nature of things and all our labs are there. So I'm going to talk to you today about one of those many topics uh, that I've uh, been doing work in over the years. This one is a quite important one. So it consumed a lot of my time. <coughs> um, so biochar and charcoal making, that's where you heat up wood until you make charcoal, essentially. And why is that important? So that's where my uh, byline, I'll see if this works. Can an ancient art, which is the making of charcoal, plus modern, modern science, our understanding of it, and why we call it biochar and so forth, does that combined equal environmentalism? Can we make a difference effectively to climate change mitigation um, in this talk? So um, the picture behind has been photoshopped, so you can't really tell what it is. So I've cleaned it up in this next one. Um, so these are the questions that were appeared on the poster. And if you just look behind it for a minute, you'll see uh, it's a bit grainy, but there's a stack of wood. Lots of bits of wood leaning up against a central post. And you'll see in a later image uh, how they cover this uh, with earth and then light a fire in it. And that is traditionally how you made charcoal. Um, so we're going to um, talk about uh, biochar, so defining it, how it's different in definition slightly from charcoal. Uh, what is the history of biochar? Uh, what are the benefits of biochar to our soils? Uh, how does the biochar help mitigate the effects of climate change and what are some of the challenges we face with biochar? And through that we hope to answer the last question, does it all equal the fundamentals? So, um, let's go back and ask that very first question. Question number one, what is biochar? Well, in its rawest sense, it's charcoal, natural charcoal. And this is Titahi Bay. If you've ever driven north out of Wellington, you uh, drive along the motorway on this side over here, and Porirua is down here. And looking across these days, you will see nice green hills. Uh, but in 2010, uh, there was a big fire there. Um, you can still see a little bit they haven't put out yet um, when this photo was taken. Uh, so when there is a natural fire, about 1-2% to 2 of the wood in that fire ends up being charcoal. So that's quite low. Uh, so, um, but it is, comes within, as you'll see shortly, the definition of biochar, to say that that charcoal is biochar. Um, so, there's another form uh, of natural uh, charcoal. And this uh, is an example of it. So there's Lake Taupo, um, and this is the region around Lake Taupo. So you're talking about uh, 100 kilometers in each direction, that in the big eruption they had about 1,850 years ago, this was covered in ash, in what we call pyroclastic flows. It was just blown out of the ground and covered uh, a huge area, and it was about 400 degrees Celsius, and it just flattened the forest. And so underneath all that ash were the trees. And these days, if you walk around that area, you can see in the uh, river gullies, uh, embankments, you can see uh, logs that are black, they've been turned to chart. So what did that do? That ash completely stopped any oxygen getting in, and it just heated the wood up without any oxygen, and it turned the logs to charcoal. Okay, they, what they were, there were also vapours that came off, but they would have percolated their way out through rock, and what was the, was the char. So, you know, very, very good quality charcoal uh, in that region. So that also, uh, in a way, um, is, is, is biochar in charcoal. So, um, the next thing we want to look at is, is what does, do plants look like when they're charred? Now, most of you will have seen charcoal in the fireplace at home, uh, and will realise that the cellular structure is preserved when it's turned to charcoal. You've lost a lot of the mass, 
but you've still got the cellular structure. So these are the vesicles and these are the cells. Um, and you know, this is, this is um, ones we've done ourselves and these are ones that were dug up out of the ground at Lake Taupo. Different uh, species of tree and things, but you can see it looks exactly the same. So let's ask ourselves what is the definition of biochar and how does it differ from just being called um, charcoal? So its definition actually involves three things. The feedstock, like what it's made from, how it's processed and how it's used afterwards. So the feedstock, to be called biochar, has to be something sustainably sourced. So if it's a plant material, it's usually from a crop that will then be regrown or a forest that is replanted. So that's what they mean by sustainably sourced. So a natural fire, like at Tatani Bay, where it's allowed to regrow, uh, effectively still comes under that definition. But anyway, with biochar, the processing of it, okay, is that it is prepared by a process called pyrolysis. Now, everyone knows combustion, because that's why it is in a fireplace at home. But what happens just before combustion inside the piece of wood is called pyrolysis because you're heating up the piece of wood and the wood decomposes and as it decomposes these vapors come out of the wood and then they combine with the air that comes past up through the grate in the fire and because it's hot enough they ignite and that makes the flames that you see and those flames return their heat into the system, which then continues to heat the wood. So pyrolysis is the first part of combustion, but if you exclude the air, you don't have the combustion, you just have the pyrolysis, and you're creating these vapours. Okay? The results of it are that you end up with a char, okay, uh, which is what we're interested in this case. You end up with these volatiles and gases as well, which just uh, leave the system. The other thing to be called biochar is its use that it is to be returned to the soil to benefit the soil, one reason, uh, for climate change mitigation, so we'll explain how that works, and for waste management. So think of a feedstock that might be a pig manure or a chicken manure from one of those sorts of farms, okay? That is a sustainably sourced um, feedstock. That you're because you're producing it from crops, the chickens eat meal from crops, they do their business, um, and you then have a manure, and those manures are often just landfill. But in places like the United States, they have 9 billion broiler hens a year. So their waste problem in the chicken manure department is huge. Um, and so they've had to develop technologies and um, using pyrolysis as one of those to reduce the environmental problem that comes from dumping manures. So, so anything that doesn't meet this sort of definition is not, cannot actually be called biochar. So it might just be charcoal. So say if you get charcoal and the bag says made in Indonesia, it probably hasn't been produced from a sustainable forest. It's just a chopped down forest which is then going to be turned into a palm plantation or something like that. Um, and so you wouldn't call that biochar. Okay? If it's a Another material which is carbonaceous, you can pyrolyse things like plastics okay, to produce more uh, fuel uh, liquids uh, and gases uh, for heat and power and so forth, um, and then it would just be called a carbonaceous material. So that's the definition. Um, so let's look at what pyrolysis is. A little bit of chemistry, not too much, just two slides, right? Um, so, Wood is represented by carbon, hydrogen, oxygen in these ratios. Okay, roughly speaking. Okay, if you talk in terms of mass, so you take 100 kilos, nearly 50 kilos of the wood is carbon. This is on a dry basis. Okay, uh, nearly six kilos of the 100 is hydrogen, and 44 is oxygen. Um, when you have these heating reactions, you heat the wood. You produce these volatiles, which escape as gases away from the wood, um, and you produce char, and you produce other gases. So the volatiles we call are the gases that will then condense again. So if you then run them through a, a cool pipe, they will come out as a liquid, so tars and oils. Okay, uh, 
uh, and the gases we call those ones that don't condense once they get out of the pipe, right? So that's called the primary reactions. Now, if you get those volatiles and you make them go past the char that you've just made, you get what we call secondary reactions, which gives you more char. And that's what we're trying to do when we make charcoal, because we want the most char, so we want these reactions, and we want these reactions um, to happen. Okay. Uh, so what you end up getting is a, an amount of char that varies from about 10% to 35%. So that means if you have 100 kilos of wood, you'll end up with at best 35 kilos of charcoal. Now, so, when you make charcoal, you can make it at different speeds. You can make it fast, and you can make it slow, uh, and what happens is you end up with different proportions of the liquid, the char, and the gas. When you make it very fast, uh, it's called fast pyrolysis, and you're really after the liquid content, those tarry, oily substances, uh, because you might be wanting to look at technologies to, to further process that to effectively make it something you can drop into a refinery, normal oil refinery, and try and get a, uh, a biomass to oil conversion. A lot of research going on in that area. Very difficult problem. Okay, because of the oxygen inside the, inside the oils. Um, when you do it very slowly, you can see here, look, you get up to 35% char, which is what we want. So that's the one that we use. Um, we're trying to have very long residence times of the vapour um, so that it uh, gives a maximum opportunity for these secondary reactions to get high charge. There's another method called gasification which I won't uh, talk about. So, let me go to ask ourselves, well, we're making this charcoal, why? What's the point of making charcoal? And the point is that it's very stable. So if you make a piece of charcoal and put it in the soil, it can last there for hundreds of years, if not thousands in some cases. If you take the piece of wood that you were going to make the charcoal from and didn't make charcoal but put the piece of wood in the ground, within a few tens of years, that log of wood will have rotted away and gone into the soil as organic matter and through the action of the first the uh, the uh, um, fauna in the soil and then the microbes thereafter through res uh, respiration and so forth, the carbon in that piece of rotten wood will disappear back up to the atmosphere and be part of that continual natural cycle of uh, carbon dioxide moving around. However, if we um, make um, some charcoal, we take the tree, chop it down and make charcoal, effectively half of the carbon in that piece of wood you can turn into charcoal. The other half you lose in that process of these gases that go off, because they they've got carbon in them. Okay, so they're lost to the atmosphere. But the other one you can put in the soil, and that charcoal in the soil, biochar as it is here, will last for hundreds of years. So when you think about it, if you grew lots and lots of trees, chop them all down, turn them all to charcoal, put the half the carbon back in the soil, you've taken out of that atmospheric cycle a fraction of carbon. Okay, and people have done these studies looking at the maximum potential of the world to do this on marginal land, you know, sort of qualifying not so much uh, land use for food, but land for non-food production. <coughs> How much of a difference you can make, and it's, it comes out to be that you can sequester at a maximum up to about 12% of our current emissions to the atmosphere, if you were to do that. So that's, uh, that is quite a bit. It doesn't solve the problem. It's a brick in the wall to solving the problem. Um, and that is something that the New Zealand government wanted us to look at. Can we make charcoal from things like forest residues, uh, from our cropping residues, uh, and return them to the soil and get some benefit for the soil, while at the same time helping our carbon balance. Of course, our emissions as New Zealand have been going up like this, you know, whereas Great Britain's have been going down like that, you know. Um, and uh, so we looked 
into it and there's been a, a lot of work done in the soil science area um, by my colleague which I'll summarise and uh, on my side I'm an engineer, so an engineering science person, so we've been looking at how you make it and how you make it well. Um, so before we go there I'm going to do uh, look at the next question, so the first question is what is biochar, <coughs> the second question is uh, what is the history of biochar, so backtrack for a bit of history here. So um, charcoal is carbon, carbon is an element, it's the first element that humans refined. Okay, and uh, in these caves, which are Chavot in France, which I do believe you had to get to by diving, get into it, that's why they were found most of the times. On the floor of these caves, down here, are these uh, charcoal making uh, pits where they made the charcoal to use to make these drawings. Okay, so charcoal made specifically for purpose. And it's quite old, 30 to 32,000 years before present. Um, humans, of course, have been associated with fire for a long time. So archaeologically, the first evidence only dates back to 94,000 years ago, but it's clear that it's been um, used much longer than that. And there's been charcoal found in deposits, but in terms of clear evidence of a heart in the making of fires, it's not so old. But, um, we do know that when people have done an energy balance on the Neanderthal's life, who weren't even modern humans, that they lived in cold places, their energy balance, their daily energy use, they would not have survived had they not used clothes, had they not had fires to cook their food, because you wouldn't have been able to digest it well enough, you can digest cooked food much better than non-cooked food, and they obviously also wore footwear. So, um, you know, the technology for fire making is very old and not only with modern humans. Um, if we come forward in time, um, people then started learning how to make containers to hold liquid in. And those containers started off being woven flax, which you lined with mud, and they found when they put them on fires, they could actually make pots out of these. Once you've learned how to make pots, then you, can, you have the technology you need for the next major event which required charcoal, which was metal smelting. So this is a map of the world, it's a very grainy one I'm afraid, but this is Turkey, okay, where uh, metal smelting was first uh, developed uh, because there were native nodules of copper and things that were lying on the ground in some places, so geologically a good area, also a very fertile area, um, the advent of um, domestication of animals and things happened in Turkey and um, uh, crops like wheat and so forth as well. And that spread over the next so many thousands of years uh, across most of the uh, middle part of the world there. To make me smelt metals you need temperatures that you can't get in a fire. And the only way to get those is by using charcoal. And um, the charcoal had two purposes one to get the temperature and the other to act as a reductant to get the oxides out so that you ended up with your pure metal as well. So that continued and of course uh, you know even in um, modern memories we had people called smiths, probably a few smiths in the room, um, that uh, used a lot of charcoal in, the, uh, in their little foundries to, to make metal objects and get things hot enough with the bellows to blow on them to get the heat you needed. Um, so the requirement for charcoal uh, has been around for a long time. So we're talking here 10,000 years in some parts of the world for this purpose. So there grew up a whole industry in charcoal making. So here's a few, you know, if you know anybody called Collier or Coleman or Curva, um, you know, if you've eaten spaghetti carbonara, um, you come across things uh, that were... Um, uh, people who worked in charcoal making or uh, was the spaghetti of the charcoal makers, uh, spaghetti carbonara. So here's the picture that I had on the on the first slide. Um, there's uh, some men putting a pole in the ground, um, stacking it up in such a way, putting earth over the top, and then you light that fire. Now there's a chap called Tony Robertson who um, who had a show in the UK called The Worst Jobs Ever because. Uh, 
uh, making charcoal required you to watch this pile uh, for uh, two and a half, two and a half days or so. Uh, and whenever some smoke leaked out of a hole, you had to go up and patch it up because you didn't want air to get in there because if you let the air get in there, like you accidentally went to sleep and you let the air get in, you'd wake up and there'd be no pile there anymore because it would burn down. And so apparently the um, charcoal makers used to sit on a one-legged stool such that when they went to sleep, they fell over and they woke up, you see. Uh, so it wasn't such, such a fun job. Um, even though you were outside, but you weren't in the fresh air, of course, because it was leaking all these fumes. Um, the other use for charcoal, apart from um, smelting, was in agriculture. So you will have heard of uh, terra preta, which is also called here in English, Amazonian dark soils, dark earth. Um, if you look at this embankment here, this is the road, and if you look at the colour of the road, it looks a little bit like Australia, right? And, uh, Brazil, if you take the trees off, is very, very poor leached out soils, just like Australia. Because, I mean, obviously they've come down from the Andes, you know, a long, long time ago and they've been totally leached out. These are the soils of these areas where the American Indians in pre-Columbian times used to um, put charcoal into the soil to improve its fertility. Which is really interesting, and this is how it worked. Okay, this is one of the earlier researchers in this area. Uh, he's standing in a pit, and he's got all these broken shards of pottery in this very dark, rich-looking soil. Okay? So this is how the villages used to operate. They'd have a village zone, and they'd have a very, very rich uh, soil around that village, and then a, a more agricultural zone further out, as the concentrations of charcoal got less. Partly, these people uh, used to hunt animals and things in the forest, and so all those uh, bones and protein sources, also organic matter, got into the soil as well to help make it nice and rich. Um, the area of land in South America that's been modified in this way is equal to the area of France. This is an enormous amount of land that's been modified by the pre-Columbian Indians. Of course. When it was finally explored 200 years after the Spanish and Portuguese had gone in there, um, there had been more than 99% death rate through disease. So it was completely depopulated and then 200 years went by. So imagine New Zealand was depopulated and then 200 years went by. There wouldn't be so much left of what we know we know as our, our, uh, our country. So that's the same, and it took until more recent times to discover and work out why they've done this. But the soils even today are very, very popular. And that led the science community to think, gee, if this happened then, can we duplicate that now? And when they started looking, they found, actually, the Indians in South America weren't the only ones that were doing this. In fact, they discovered that the Japanese are doing it even today. You know, traditional practice of burning the rice husk and the charcoal and putting it back into the soil. Um, there's a lot of soils in the Netherlands and things like that that have been modified in this way as well um, around the world. Um, so the questions were raised, can we do this in the modern context? And that's why the New Zealand government funded us to this. Can we do this in New Zealand too in a modern agriculture? <coughs> and, uh, so, here's another picture. So traditional societies, this is the modern culture. Traditional societies, uh, uh, even today, have this practice of slash and burn. So you'll go into a bit of forest, um, trees in the way, you can't grow anything, no sunlight, so you burn it down. Okay, you get this ash, and this ash makes the soil quite fertile for a year or two, until it rains and washes it away. Okay, and so what well, quite a few uh, researchers have been doing is going around to these places where people are very um, malnourished as well, you can tell by the dog, not too healthy, um, and um, saying, well, why not try a slightly different approach called slash and char, so that you're charring the wood as you go. The result of this is that these slash and burn, they use a lot less forest because it's done more slowly, the uh, fertility of the soil stays a lot longer because of the properties of the biochar, which I'll get on to in the next slide. Okay? Um, so that has helped in some communities because these, you know, it's um, 
still very traditional in some parts. I think the work we I think I got these from was a presentation I'd seen in the United States, and the guy was working in the Cam uh, Cameroon, I think it was. Okay, um, okay so um, what are the benefits of biochar to soils? Um, now, a soil scientist could talk for a long time about this, right? So I'm going to kind of cover in general terms and then ask me if there's any people out there afterwards um, uh, any more specific questions I can try and try and help out. So biochar doesn't benefit all soils, okay? But it can have some effects in terms of increased crop yields, um, water retention, better water retention. You can imagine it's porous, so we'll do that. Uh, it can mean you need less fertilizer. Um, it can mean it doesn't require as much energy to harvest. That's interesting. And it can also result in less global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. So how does it do that? Well, the science of that is that it helps aerate the soil. Because it's a porous material, it's like putting gravel into your clay soil. It's to help allow the air to get in much better. That allows it to drain better. Uh, when things drain better, they don't produce so much methane. So that's the way it helps lower methane, not through any chemical process, just by having the soil more aerated and having aerobic processes going on. It lowers the soil bulk density. It's very, very light. So if you mix it into the soil, it actually makes it easy to pull a plough through, so it doesn't require as much energy to harvest. Um, the soil's not as strong as well. Um, now, you've got this thing called a liming effect. So, you know lime, a lot of lime works around New Zealand. They put the lime on to reduce the acidity of the soil to make it more alkaline, right? Um, and um, biochar does this through its ash. So the ash in your fireplace is a good liming agent to put on your garden. It's the same same effect. Um, it also through alters the supply of electron acceptors and redox potential in the soil. So what's that to do with it's? It's really um, when you're breaking down the wood, you're knocking off things like carboxylic groups and so forth, and you end up with exposed electrons which allow you to have more interchange with ionic um, compounds in the soil. So that's helpful. Um, it also, through these, this process, uh, helps reduce the uh, nitrous oxide emission from the soil. Now nitrous oxide is 290 times worse than carbon dioxide in terms of the global greenhouse gas. And it's actually one of those things that you've got to try and reduce. New Zealand agriculture uh, is working on how to do that effectively. Um, you also have something called a priming effect on organic matter. So what does that mean? If you take 100 kilos of um, biomass and you just plow them into the soil, um, they will rot away and eventually the carbon in them will end up going back through respiration to the atmosphere, right? If you take that 100 kilos and you turn it to charcoal and then put it in the soil, that charcoal will remain there for a long, long time, but it will slowly decrease, ever, ever so slowly. But what the charcoal does is it enhances any further organic matter from the natural growth and death processes of the plants in there. It allows the organic matter to build up a bit, naturally. So it has a, what's called a priming effect, which is probably why those Amazonian soils were so dark because of this priming effect that allows more organic matter to end up in the soil. Um, another thing that it does is that um, it allows the phosphorus that's in the biochar when you make it to become easily available by the plants. Phosphorus is one of those elements that uh, we're constrained with in the world. This is why the United States has a free trade agreement with Morocco, because they have the phosphorus, right? And the US needs it, that sort of thing. So. Um, we also have a lot of phosphorus, I think, off the Chatham Rise, undersea phosphorus, which has been a big issue, you know, um, and, and been thrown out um, uh, of the Environment Court. And at least the company, I think, eventually withdrew it because of the you know, environmental concerns we had. But I understand that same companies now in Africa finding sources over there doing you know, what they're doing. Um, but phosphorus is something the world will be constrained at, so there's a lot of research going along the way around the world. How do we get phosphorus that we've got in our food chain back into the food system at the growing end? Because it certainly have to put it on in this fertilizer, it comes through the food chain, ends up in the waste treatment plant, um, goes out to sea because it goes through with the water. So we're trying to, or, or we immobilize it. Um, other things too, uh, 
leaching of uh, agrochemicals, when you've got the charcoal, it's very absorbent. So it can suck things up and it holds them there for a bit longer. So you don't have as much leaching of fertilizers, so you don't need to put so much on in the first place. So it's, it's, it's helpful in that way. So these are all the benefits. That's my slide on the benefits to soil. Now we go on to this next question. How can biochar help mitigate the effects of climate change? Really, we've got to start doing this by looking at the biochar system. The whole thing that wraps around biochar. And that system is a really complicated looking diagram. But what we've got here is the biomass phase. That's the feedstock. You grow the feedstock. You then have a conversion. You turn it into charcoal. Then you take the charcoal out and you use it somewhere. Put it back in the soil. What they talk about are these contexts. There's two types of contexts: the environmental context, which affects all, affects all three phases, and the socio-economic context, which affects all three phases. We in our research haven't looked at any socio-economic. We weren't funded enough to do that. Um, and the systems: you've got an agricultural and waste system that feed into the feedstock, and at the other end, you've got the systems which are your renewable energy, climate, and your land use, of which some of it's farming okay, systems. So, um, to understand things, we looked at the environmental context. That's what we looked at. So the next slide is about that. Okay. So, in an environmental context, just imagine you have a uh, biomass, and we looked at uh, forest residues, orchard prunings, and wheat straw. Okay, so sort of three we looked at. Um, if you have one ton of biomass and um, you do nothing to it, so forest residues you just leave them there. They go back into the ground and back into the system. Orchard residues, the doing nothing scenario is you just run your mower over them, leave them on the ground. Wheat straw you just plough back into the soil. Right? Um, so <coughs> doing that or doing nothing actually means you've got some soil quality just because of the environmental matter. You know, it's like putting your compost in the garden, you know, after it's come out of the compost. But, um, so if you're going to do anything like make biochar, you still have to deliver the same soil quality, don't you? But if you took the biomass and chuck on it, it can't, it can't do the same thing. So you've got to add a bit of fertilizer, you see? And so what we did is looked at two different scenarios. We said, let's take that biomass and, and either turn, do make biochar out of it, or let's just make energy out of that biomass. Because that's an alternative use. If you've got waste wood, you can put it in a boiler and make energy and sell that energy to somebody instead of burning coal, say, or natural gas. Or you can, say, make charcoal and put it back in the soil. So when we do um, this, this is the energy case, um, we, we, I think we've got everything here. We've got a few other things, okay? When we do the energy, it means our one tonne of biomass didn't go into the soil, did it? didn't deliver anything to soil. So what should we actually do if we have to add some fertilizer to add to the soil? You see? So we're actually doing an accounting system so that we're still delivering the same benefit we would have originally had, but getting the energy out as well. Okay? And then if we do the, the case where we're um, making uh, biochar, we still have to do the same thing. The process is slightly different. We have to dry our feedstock, we have to make some slow pyrolysis to make some charcoal and then apply the charcoal to the soil to deliver that soil quality. And in the process of making that charcoal, we've actually produced a bit of gas and we made a little bit of heat and we've sold a little bit of heat as well, you see. So what we do is we look at the environmental impact of those things and say, what is the best use of the original biomass? Okay? And then we come up with, I'll just zip through here. So, if we did the do nothing, which is business as usual, we left the residues in the forest, or the orchard prunings mowed them onto the ground, or the wheat we just plowed back into the soil, um, we had to spend a bit of energy. So we had a bit of an impact on the climate because orchard prunings, we've got to run the mower over them. The mower uses diesel, and so we've had to have a climate impact of 40 kilograms of carbon dioxide per, per, per tonne of orchard products that we put in the ground, right? Logging, we didn't do anything. We didn't have to mow it, they just left them in the forest. So we didn't do anything, so it didn't cost us anything. And the wheat straw, same thing, we, got to, we had to plough it in. So this is the tractor 
these are the okay? um, If we then do um, the other scenarios, and I want to jump immediately down to this one at the bottom, this is where we make biochar, these numbers are quite negative. So what does that mean? Our impact on the climate is negative. It means actually it's a good thing, because we've now put less carbon dioxide, because it's a negative number, into the atmosphere than just leaving it as the business as usual scenario. Because these are little smaller numbers, they're good. And what I've got in the brackets is the key thing here, is that in each scenario, this is how much the carbon dioxide we have effectively locked up as charcoal. So from our tonne that we started at biomass, we've locked up 260 kilos of equivalent carbon dioxide out <coughs> of that atmospheric cycle. So it's actually quite good, good for the environment. And the three scenarios have different numbers. Okay. The heat and power, if you look at just the size of the numbers, they are more negative than biochar. That means that they're better than doing biochar. Doesn't feel right, does it? But it's only better in the sense of the way they do carbon accounting. If somebody's got a power plant that runs <coughs> on the coal, so we imagine a large dairy producer running spray dryers might be using coal to burn to make the heat, right? If they then converted to using biomass, <coughs> they could claim the credit that they're now no longer using a fossil fuel. Okay? So, in that case, which we call, it's called with offsetting, these numbers apply. But only the first mover can claim that. Okay, so only for those people who have already got a fossil fuel plant to convert can they claim an offset. Anybody else who's starting up a new spray dryer and needs a new power plant can't claim an offset just because they're using biomass. So really, these are these numbers, even though they look better, they aren't able to be used for more than, more than the first people doing the conversions. Uh, this, this is a sustainable thing, and so the uh, conclusion with that, let's see, what have we got here? Oh, I'll just explain those in there. Is that how can biochar help mitigate the effects of climate change? And the answer is by locking away carbon, which other uses of biomass cannot do. So from an environmental point of view, um, burned biochar is the best use of residue biomass. So on to our last question. What are some of the challenges we face with biochar? And there's three that I'm going to talk about here. One of the challenges is in production. One's in the quality of the biochar. And the other is in the accounting of uh, biochar as a carbon credit. Okay. I've done a lot of work in production. Um, so let's have a look at this. So this is your system of this, uh, the materials handling and processing system. You've got your harvest, your pyrolysis, and your delivery. Not looking at the environmental side, not looking at the uh, um, socio-economic side. So you've got feed, harvesting the feedstock from whatever source it might be, waste, forest, pastoral, transporting it to some processing facility where you chip it, dry it, stockpile it, blend it, make it into charcoal, you make some gas, you make some oil, um, you store the char, um, you know, there's things you have to do to then make it safe, uh, formulate it into the form that it's going to be put in the soil, transport it, deliver it, and put it into the soil, however you do that, spray it on, drill it in, um, uh, sow it um, in pellets. It's not altogether straightforward because what scale were you going to make this pyrolyzer? Is it going to be a great big one or a little wee one? And that's actually quite important. And so if you have a little wee one, it means it's mobile. You can drive it on the back of the trailer out to the farm where you're going to use it, do the processing, and then drive away to the next farm. If you have a large unit, you have to gather up all your biomass, ship it to the reactor, then bring back the charcoal. Okay? If you have a large one, your costs are in transportation. But you can do more in the processing. So pyrolysis is the central thing here, but you can actually take advantage of your, your, your liquids and you can run that to make heat and electricity and so forth. But if you've got a small unit, you only make your charcoal and you burn off everything else. 
And it works out, as you'll see shortly, um, the very next slide indeed, so I'll go straight to it. Um, there's a whole lot of numbers on here. But what I want to point out is that, just take one example, I've got two examples here. Take the forest residues, that whether you use a small scale or a large scale, so small scale means 3,400 tonnes of charcoal per year, and a large scale is 35,000, that it's going to cost you around about $400 to make a tonne of biochar, no matter what scale you use. Because large scale, your big cost is transport. And you're transporting stuff that doesn't weigh much. Charcoal weighs very little, so you're transporting trucks full of air around. Um, and that costs you quite a lot in the end. Small scale, you don't get the advantage of making heat and power, but actually, the difference between making heat and power is very, very little. And these other columns over here are if the cost if you were then offsetting a natural gas plant. So that's for that first mover problem. It actually doesn't reduce the cost by more than, you know, ten dollars or so. It's actually you know, it doesn't actually gain you anything to do do those replacements. So really around about four hundred dollars a tonne there, slightly less in other systems, um, and these ones are between two and three hundred dollars. Um, what I then do is I then convert that dollars per tonne of charcoal produced into a dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide because carbon's got a molecular weight of 12 and oxygen's got 16 so carbon dioxide weighs 44 and carbon weighs 12 so you know you actually end up um, because of the weight you end up getting your unit cost kind of drops down so this is a price somewhere in the hundred and sort of thirty to hundred and fifty dollars <coughs> per tonne is what it would cost you to make a sequester one tonne of CO2 now, what's the price of CO2 at the moment? It's about $5 a tonne. Mm -hmm. So, if you need to get $130 a tonne, the market is a long, long way from that to make it economic. Okay, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Here we go. Another problem with production is emissions. So, this is our reactor. It's about four metres high sitting at our uh, lab in Palmerston North, a bit of smoke coming off the top. I won't show you the graphs. Our emissions are seven times higher than they should be. We've gone and redesigned the whole top end of the system. Looks a lot more impressive now. And we're just going through the tests to make sure we can get our emissions under regulations. Okay, That's the big thing that we're doing at the moment. Our reactor was quite a fancy one. It tilt tilts on its side. We can empty it and fill it. Um, you can see here there's a drum within a drum. Okay, so this is a diagram of how it works. We have a big combustion chamber at the bottom here with two burners, a big burner, a little burner. Um, the hot air goes up around the outside of the inner drum. That heats the material in the drum, which makes gases, and those gases work their way into the central core. And there you can see the central core is perforated. So the gases, so what doing that means your mass and your heat transfer are going in the same direction don't have them going in the same direction, it takes forever to pyrolyze something. So to get them moving in the same <coughs> direction is very important. And then once the gases come through, they come down here, they hit the flash pan, if there's any drips of tar, and then they revolatilize and they partially combust, and away they go. If we let them totally combust, like we pushed a lot of air in there, we would melt our reactor. So you've actually got to design it such that you can strain things. If you look at our system, it's got a very narrow stack. That stack design is purposely designed so that we don't entrain too much air. It strains that. And then we flare everything else at the top. So this is the behavior of a small scale production and aim to meet your emissions requirements. We had issues with our um, ignition system here. We were actually putting in so much soot and things up there that we would soak up the oxygen and snuff out the flame and we had issues with our we had one blower blowing air into all these burners and when we turned one of these off it changed the resistances and it got too complicated for itself but we've solved all that now and it works uh, very well and I've got a guy who's uh, from Brazil in fact uh, doing his masters on the uh, carbon footprint of this machine here so anyone wants to make charcoal we can help you out uh, we were funded in part uh, uh, to make this publicly available, this design, so there's uh, no IP that we're trying to keep or anything. Um, and we will 
will make that freely available when we can say, hang on half, that our emissions meet regulations. Okay. That's that challenge. Um, another challenge is in and around the quality of the biochar, because biochar is made from all sorts of things. So how do you define the quality? So they've come up with a whole lot of standards, and one is to do with, you, you classify it on how good it is at storing carbon. So that's, you know, I'm talking about that climate change mitigation, it's all to do with storing carbon. But because you make it from things like manures, chicken manures, big manure, you've got a lot of fertiliser value in there, because there's a lot of nutrients. If you make biochar from pine, there's only 1.2% of ash in pine, it's almost nothing. You get almost no fertiliser value if you use pine, right? If you use these uh, manures, you can get quite a lot. Then there's this liming thing. That's the, the, like the ash from your fireplace you put on the garden to help reduce the acidity of the soil. That's the same thing there. Now, we also have this particle size, which is to do with, um, with uh, moisture retention and whether it's helping to get the soil aerated and so forth, uh, and free draining and so forth. Um, they talk about down here suitability for soil, this agriculture, that's hydroponics and so forth. Um, another problem, toxicity. Okay, you get these things uh, called polyaromatic hydrocarbons. One of my major areas of research now, because we've kind of got found that we showed that this was uneconomic, of course, and so it's very hard to ask New Zealand government for more money, right? And being engineers, we thought, what can we do? We've now got a big research program on in food smoking. So it's anything interested in the charcoal, we're interested in those volatiles. But we also are interested very much in these things, which are these carcinogenic compounds. You know these things called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. If anyone makes toast for breakfast, you'll be eating polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. <laughs> anyone fries your bacon, you'll be getting these things in there too. Uh, toasted muesli, it's all there. Anything that's been baked and fried and so forth has these things in them. But we don't want too many of them, right? And with um, uh, so there are regulations in and around with foods in Europe. New Zealand has no regulations on our food. Nor does Australia, nor does the United States. Just the Europeans, but it's going to come. Everyone will have it. But um, the biochar community are ahead of the curve here and don't want it in their biochar. Um, you've got other things, dioxins and furans, also carcinogenic, and these polychlorinated biphenyls um, also. And so there's levels around those. So really you've got to make sure it's not toxic. Um, quite important, so that's why we have regulations or at least guidelines at the moment to get those. The last challenge is accounting. To biochar, we know if we put it in soil, it's locking away carbon. So, how do you monetize that? We've done it with growing trees and carbon stored in trees in the carbon register. And you can sell credits based on that. If you fly in New Zealand, you can tick the box to, you know, pay a little bit more and offset your flight. They'll be buying some trees. Okay. So how do you monetize it? Well, it's very difficult because there's a few problems. And the problems are, when we put that biochar in the soil, how do we know it stays there? We know it lasts a long time. But how, how did it wash down into the river and out to sea? Is the soil being moved like this and it's slowly grinding? We know charcoal is very friable, is it called? You know, grind all that's a powder easily. Um, and in fact, so there's still some issues around that because they found in some of the estuaries in Australia <coughs> that 50% of the mud is actually black carbon from all these fires that they've had. It's just washed down, you know? And uh, so, um, yeah, so you've got the other issue, you know, that sort of comes into the soil carbon accounting partly, is that when you've got soil carbon and you're measuring, you can't actually distinguish between what's organic carbon from natural plants that are just in the process of slowly breaking down, or charcoal that you put in there that's going to stay there for a lot longer. And so when you're um, measuring soil carbon, it's very difficult um, to measure soil carbon in a large area. You have to do one little hole here, and here, and here, and here, and that becomes very expensive to do and measure it all uh, at once. So there's no uh, huge averaging techniques to count soil carbon. Um, we've got this other issue of validation, monitoring, reporting and verification. What's that? That's making sure nobody cheats. That's what that's all about. You know, right from the people growing a um, sustainable forest who then decide to turn to housing development. It's not sustainable anymore, is it? Why not? 
tell anybody. Um, and uh, right down to people actually making the charcoal, making sure they meet emission standards, the use of it, that it goes to the right places. It's actually very expensive to do this. Um, so yes, then we've got this issue of terms of entry into a monetized system. So what does that mean? One tonne of carbon dioxide you know, has a value in the market. Um, the question is what that is. When you're talking in terms of trees, you're talking in terms of an avoided emission, not a sequestered amount. So you're talking with trees, it's avoiding putting stuff into the atmosphere versus taking stuff out of the cycle. So there is talk about if you did go to buy a chart, you should have a different value for it, a higher value. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So that, there's lots more things that can be questions. But do you have any more? Um, I guess the last thing is, is, you know, does it all equal environmentalism? Well, it all gets a bit blurred, doesn't it? You know, because it becomes quite difficult to actually pinpoint where it's going to be a value to society because nobody's actually making any money with it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it does come down to economics. People make biochar, people sell biochar. You can buy, um, you can buy it in, in some places like garden centres and so forth. People that buy things in garden centres. Um, they're not dominated by economics. You will buy things in a garden centre because you want to, not because you have to. Um, and uh, it's the large-scale agriculture that we were funded to look at, and for them, it comes down to economics. If we make a tonne of biochar and it costs $400 to make, and we put 10 tonnes per hectare on, the farmer's suddenly going to make $4,000 extra dollars per hectare, and when it provides uh, the extra growth and things like that is very, very difficult to determine. It's much better in very poor soils, like those in Brazil or those in Australia. New Zealand's got already got quite good soils. We're a young geological country, quite high organic carbon contents in the soil. Um, it blends into the background a little bit, and you can't see that extra value come through. So um, it's something that will certainly be in the public mind, uh, but in terms of how it's, whether it's going to go into large-scale agriculture one. There are more niche applications to use it as an adsorbent, um, so for runoff issues, um, it can help with it. Yes. So I hope I haven't sobered the mood too much. <laughs> <laughs>